Flat Rock Run John Doe, also known as Luther, identified as John Krasinski. In 1989, 33-year-old John Krasinski walked away from his father's home, and this would be the last time that anyone saw him. But like so many at-risk people, there was a good reason he wasn't reported missing. John had some struggles with mental illness, and it wasn't unusual at all for him to walk away for months at a time. So his family waited for his call, like they always did. Like so many families before them, they just believed that he chose to walk away. It's unclear if they ever reported him missing, but to be honest, based on all of the doe cases that I've covered, it's highly unlikely that the police would have taken a report anyway. He was an adult, and he had a right to walk away, and there was no sign that there was anything wrong. So, unfortunately for them, it was a call that would never come. A different kind of a call would come in elsewhere. There was a call stating that someone had been walking in the Sheep Flats area of Marion County, Ohio, and accidentally stumbled upon John's remains. He'd been there for weeks to months, and he carried no ID. There were no clues as to who he was in life. Even the cause of death was hard to tell. It appeared he'd been suffocated, but he'd also been shot with something. It could have been an arrow, or it could have been a bullet. They were unable to tell. The sheriff went on to say it's a very basic investigative tool on a homicide or crime to identify the person and retrace their steps. Without a name, they felt they could not retrace the steps at all, and as a result, they could not find who did it. They tried over the years to release various recreations of what he might have looked like, but those recreations led to zero tips coming in. So they tried once more in 2017, carving an image this time using 3D scans. They used this image to run it through BCI databases, but there was no match again, and there were no tips. So by June 2019, the Sheriff's Office and the Ohio BCI enlisted the help of the DNA Doe Project. The Doe Project first seeks funding from volunteers, and once it's funded, they upload the DNA to DeadMatch, and then new volunteers attempt to build a family tree. This is time-consuming and can take years, but in the end, it gave John Krasinski his name back. John's family released this statement saying it's been 32 years and people have moved on, but asking that if anyone at all knew what had happened to John if they could call the Marion County Sheriffs. If we get some tips from people who might have known John back in the day, let us know. Hopefully we can bring this case to justice. John Krasinski went unidentified for 33 years. Horseshoe Harriet, identified as Robin Pelkey. The woman, once known as Horseshoe Harriet, got that name because she was found near Horseshoe Lake in Anchorage, Alaska. She was actually a homeless teen. She was just 19 years old when her life was taken in 1984 by a serial named Robert Hansen. I don't like to mention their monikers because this is what feeds people like him, but we've listed it on the screen. They knew that Robin's life was taken by a local man who owned a bakery, but who she was remained a mystery. In addition to Robin, it turns out there were 16 other known victims, though the remains of only 12 have been found. He preyed on the most at-risk women in the community, and it's an honor to be able to share his booking photo. Thanks to a brave woman who got away, he was finally caught and prosecuted. Some of Robin's relatives were located when processing the DNA, and those families were found in both Arkansas and Alaska. It turns out Robin had lived in Anchorage in the late 1970s. She eventually moved to Arkansas as a teenager those family members told troopers that Robin returned to Alaska in 1981 to live with her father and stepmother. Early reports listed her as being from Denver, Colorado. It's unclear if that's a mistake or if she lived there also. I suspect it's a mistake. Robin was buried beneath a simple headstone and those in the community did all they could to pay respect and tribute to the unidentified woman. The police wanted to find her name, including one trooper who worked her case for 37 years and never let it go. Sadly, there was little to go on other than the rings they found her wearing. They exhumed her body in 2017 in order to do a recreation. Unfortunately, they found this wasn't possible thanks to the damage that Hansen did. Robin was both shot and stabbed. Hansen told investigators at the time that he had abducted her from downtown Anchorage sometimes in the winter of 1983. 
He said he flew her to the lake via his small plane, where he took her life and discarded her, claiming not to even know her name. Her skeletal remains were found there lying on the ground near Horseshoe Lake, just a few miles northwest of Anchorage. Once Hansen was caught, he actually blamed the women instead of himself. He was serving a 461-year sentence when he passed away in 2014. Robin Pelkey went unidentified for 37 years. The Gardendale John Doe, identified as Timothy Gomez. In September of 2019, a rancher was rounding up cattle on his Texas ranch when he found a skull that would later be identified as belonging to Timothy Gomez. Investigators would eventually find more remains, sending them to the medical examiner's office in Tarrant County for examination. It was eventually estimated that these belonged to a man who had been there for two to five years. They could tell very little about him. They knew he was wearing Adidas shoes, a Carhartt belt, and Levi's jeans. He had a key fob that belonged to a 2002 Audi. Texas Rangers did their best, but the car that the keys belonged to was never found. Othram Labs was able to generate a usable sample that would lead to the identification of Timothy Gomez. Timothy's age wasn't released, nor was his cause of death. They didn't even provide where he came from. Investigators have, however, made a plea that if anyone knew him to please call with the information. Even if the information seems innocuous, if you knew him at all, please call to offer details of his life. Timothy Gomez has gone unidentified for two years. The Coos Bay John Doe, 1971, identified as Winston Maxey III. This is the first time one of my unidentified videos, which is set to run in the future, has been solved before that happens, which is obviously still a great thing. It's exciting that these individuals are getting their names back at a faster pace. The first three cases were solved by Othram Labs. In this case, however, we have Parabon Nano Labs to thank for Winston Maxey's name coming back to him. Winston went by the name Wint. It turns out that 50 years ago, Wint left his home in Boise, Idaho at the age of 15 after a friend told him there were job opportunities in Oregon. He confided in his sister that he planned to hitchhike there. No one really knows what happened to him once he arrived. Another thing that Wint didn't know at the time was that he had an unborn child that would come after his death took place. That child was placed up for adoption. He made it nearly 500 miles away on his journey before it ended so tragically. Wint was found in 1971 inside of Snedden Creek in Coos Bay, Oregon. Very little was known about him when he was found. They predicted he was probably 14 to 18, 5 foot 4 to 5 6, and around 150 pounds. They believed he had long, light brown hair and was wearing Wrangler jeans and a turtleneck. We would find out later that he had red hair. I'm going to use his daughter's words to tell her story because they brought tears to my eyes and I believe they will to yours also. She had a Facebook group that she was using to look for her father. She'd been looking for him her whole life. It all started over 50 years ago. A young boy and a girl, both from struggling homes in a small southern Idaho town. The young boy leaves to make a better life for himself, and the young girl is taken to the big city to stay at an unwed mother's home in the early 1970s. The baby girl is then adopted out. The young girl grows up knowing she's adopted and yearning to find her birth family, to know who she looks like and why she has the gifts and talents that she does narrowing it down to a 150 mile radius to where she was born. She reaches out to a private detective and within 24 hours in 1988, she is given the name of her birth mom and other information. They talk on the phone and they soon meet. The connection is overwhelming. It was joyful and a sense of peace all at the same time. That Christmas, the young lady learns about her birth father. Mother had to let her know the red hair gave it away and she was informed of her birth dad and his family. A relationship with his family began. Since 1988, I've been looking for my birth father. And this August, I was contacted by C.C. Moore from Parabon Nano Labs about a John Doe in Coos Bay, Oregon from 1971. She thought there might be a match. We ran my DNA and it did match. Today, the press release went out. It brings me and my family some closure, but we still do not know what happened. Her Facebook explained she was only given one picture of her father. There were a number of posts, if anyone is interested, to see her journey. Cause of death couldn't be determined. 
It's entirely possible it was an accident due to exposure. He was exhumed again in 2017 in hopes of extracting his DNA, and this did work. It would be this DNA that eventually led to his daughter, Lori Merriam. Parabon was able to recreate a DNA profile snapshot in May of 2021. It took more investigation to find his name, but it perhaps offered a clearer picture of what he may have looked like. Unfortunately, the photo didn't lead to his identification. When I originally recorded this for my unidentified series, I explained that I felt the Parabon Lab snapshot software makes images based on DNA that are very close. I'm not quite as sure now. I realize they used the hairstyle he had when he was found versus the only photo his daughter was ever given. So out of curiosity, I placed Winston's real hair on top of the one that they created. Do me a favor and let me know what you think. How close was the digital snapshot? Winston Maxey III went unidentified for 50 years. Gacy victim number five, also known as body five, identified as Francis Wayne Alexander. This one is really exciting, and I've added a link to the description below for our unidentified John Wayne Gacy victim video. Huge thanks to Elizabeth, this channel's moderator, who caught the identification so quickly, and I was able to add it to this episode. This is one of many, so many of us have been waiting to happen. Francis Wayne Alexander went by the name of Wayne and was found more than 40 years ago in the crawl space beneath John Wayne Gacy's home. He was branded with a somewhat degrading name of Body 5. For four decades, authorities have tried to find his identity, and this is another one where the DNA Doe Project came through. Just a reminder, you can help fund specific cases on the DNA Doe Project's website, but you can also help them for free by making DNA Doe Project your charity on Amazon Smile. This is something I've done, and it's something anyone can do. You just search for the DNA Doe Project and name it as your charity. And when you check out, make sure that you do it through the Amazon Smile link. It's that easy. The DNA Doe Project arranged for Wayne's tooth to be sent to the lab for sequencing. This would eventually return with his name, but obviously that's only part of the story. The part that is always the most important, to me anyway, is finding out who Wayne was in life. Not a lot has been released so far, but his DNA led through Jedmatch to his second cousin, and eventually to Wayne himself. His family went on to share that Wayne was living in Chicago and had the misfortune of living near John Wayne Gacy. As most people know, Gacy worked as a clown and owned a construction company. He lured young men into his house with promises of jobs and other ploys. Because he was so good at falsely presenting himself as somebody he was not, 33 young men would fall victim. But Wayne and the other men that fell victim were so much more than just a victim. They were people who lived and had lives of their own. Wayne disappeared in 1976 or 1977. He was born in North Carolina and lived for a while in New York, eventually moving to Chicago. His family never stopped missing Wayne, and they spent all of the last 43 years hoping he would come home. It's human nature in so many of these cases to believe that their loved one was still alive and was just choosing not to contact them. Perhaps it's easier than thinking of the alternative. In this case, Wayne distanced himself from his family the year before, after the trauma of ending his marriage at the age of 20, a marriage that only lasted three months. He stepped away from his family intentionally, trying to find himself, and his family never dreamed he was no longer alive. They spent the last four decades hoping he would walk through the door. They believed they were respecting his wishes to allow him to step away for a while. In reality, he was likely gone within the next year. It is believed that he fell victim to Gacy between January 20th, 1976 and March 15th, 1977, in part based on the location he was found in, in the house. He was just 21 or 22. A member of the Sheriff's Department, Lieutenant Jason Moran, traveled to North Carolina to personally break the news in person to the family of Wayne Alexander. By the time he got there, he found four generations of Wayne's family in one room, waiting for the results. Results they probably knew because he was flying to see them. Moran eventually stated, they were all waiting to hear the news of their missing son, brother, uncle. It was sensitive and emotional, but at the end, all of the family agreed, it's better to know than not to know. 
The family itself released a statement thanking the Sheriff's Department and the DNA Doe Project, saying it's hard, even 45 years later, to know the fate of our beloved Wayne. He was killed at the hands of a vile and evil man. Our hearts are heavy, and our sympathies go out to the other victims' families. Our only comfort is in knowing that this man no longer breathes the same air that we do. We can now lay rest to what happened and move forward by honoring Wayne. John Wayne Gacy was executed by lethal injection in 1994. Francis Wayne Alexander went unidentified for 43 years. The Lake County John Doe, identified as Leopoldo Torres Melendez. October of 2021 has brought many identifications to cold cases. This last case is that of 44-year-old Leopoldo Melendez. In November of 1976, the Lake County Sheriff's Office received a report that human remains were located in a heavily wooded area off of Highway 29 in Lower Lake, California. Very little has been released regarding this case, and it's possible that very little is known. The cause of death was due to blunt force trauma. Lack of identification and clues led to this case being cold for 44 years. This is another win for Parabon Nano Labs. They processed his DNA in January of 2007 and ran it through CODES, but the DNA they extracted was pretty degraded and no match was found. Eventually, in January of 2020, detectives enlisted Parabon Nano Labs. They were in fact able to obtain a sample that was usable. Once they processed this, they were able to upload it into GEDmatch and begin the process of building his family tree. By June of 2021, they had several leads. They began processing matches from within the tree. Thankfully, this led to Leopoldo's sister, who had been searching for her brother since the 1970s. She herself also submitted her DNA and then found herself waiting to see if her brother had actually been found. And in fact, he had. Leopoldo Torres Melendez once again had his name. Leopoldo had been born in Puerto Rico and was 41 when his life was taken. They had been searching for him the entire time, but had no idea where exactly to look. They knew that when he was 41, he was living in San Francisco. And then nothing, he just seemed to disappear. Anyone with any information at all about Leopoldo's movements in San Francisco or anywhere in the vicinity is asked to call. Lower Lake is about 100 miles away from San Francisco. No one is sure how we got there or why. Any information at all would be helpful. Leopoldo Torres Melendez has gone unidentified for 44 years. This is the first time using my new Blue Yeti microphone. Any suggestions are welcome. Just please post them below. Thank you everyone so much for watching and listening. If you have a chance, please take a moment to comment, like, and subscribe. We have new episodes every Monday and Thursday, and Thursday episodes are always about John or Jane Doe's. Take care of yourselves and each other.